It turns out that non-covalent bonding is very important in biological macromolecules and molecules. And like water, it is possible to form hydrogen bonds between other types of molecules where a hydrogen, which is partially positive, interacts with another molecule that is par partially negative, so that the hydrogen becomes shared between two, two different molecules or are, are parts of, of a single molecule. So hydrogen bonding is one of the key non-covalent types of bonds that we find in biochemistry. A second type is ionic or electrostatic interactions. Positive attracts negative. We're all familiar with that. And you can see that in interacting, these are two amino acids, glutamate and lysine. Glutamate is negatively charged. We'll talk more about that later. Lysine is positive, positively charged. It has an amino group. And so positive attracts negative, And you have these ionic or sometimes called electrostatic interactions. Hydrophobic interactions are not really bonds. It's more like a force because if you take oil and water and you shake them up, they separate back to oil and water. And that's because the presence of an apolar molecule in water interrupts hydrogen bonding and water rejects it. It's literally the water is phobic about having these apolar groups. And so you end up with apolar molecules that are sequestered and that interact and can actually create quite significant forces comparable to a hydrogen bond. So these apolar interactions can add up very significantly. And finally, there are van der Waals interactions. If you have two atoms, it turns out that often there will be a polarization where there's a partial positive and a partial negative part in the atoms. And that induces in an adjacent atom a similar polarization. And then, because one is partially negative charged and the other is positively, partially positively charged, you end up between, with an attraction between the two atoms. And it turns out that these forces, while very, very, very small, can add up. And so geckos, for example, can climb on glass on these very sheer surfaces using van der Waals forces because they have these microscopic projections on their foot pads that are able to interact with the surfaces through these types of van der Waals interactions. So while very weak, in aggregate, if you have a number of them, they are strong enough to allow this walking up a, a sheer wall, and yet the foot pad is able to release and move forward so that it's not a, a permanent interaction, it is a transient interaction. If you look at the bond strengths, you can see that covalent bonds on average, they vary probably from 60 to 100 and something, but on average, particularly a carbon-carbon bond, will be about 90 kilocalories per mole. You have to put in that much energy to break a carbon-carbon bond. On the other hand, the non-covalent binding is much lower energy, generally less than 5 kilocalories per mole. And on, on order, hydrogen bond interactions are a little better than ionic interactions, are a little better than hydrophobic, that are a little better than van der Waals, which are the weakest of the non-covalent. But all of them are less than 5 kilocalories per mole. That means that they can be, although they can provide stability, they can also be easily broken, as in the gecko climbing up the wall of glass. It turns out that non-covalent bonding is actually essential to life. That just as the gecko can climb up the wall, these interactions promote assembly, and they are intrinsic. They are inherent in the properties of the molecules so that they occur spontaneously. The, and this large number of small forces, like what happens climbing up the wall, can create a significant flexibility in the structures and in the structures that form. And membranes are a great example.
So membranes are actually formed by a molecule that has a hydrophobic apolar tail. So it's, it, it doesn't like being exposed to water. And a hydrophilic polar head, which likes being exposed to water. And you can see here the apolar tails are interacting with one another on one side of the bilayer and on, with one another on the other side of the bilayer. But if that was all that happens, you would have this very apolar surface and a very polar surface. And what happens is the two apolar surfaces of the bilayer come together to create this lipid bilayer that is polar on the outside and apolar on the inside. And in reality, these form spheres so that there is only the polar outside exposed to water and the polar outside exposed to water on the inside of the cell because these are the membranes of the cell. And then the membrane itself is this very apolar section that has these proteins that stick through it and are involved in transport that we'll talk about later. later. So I want you to think about why the properties of water are so essential to living organisms. Think about what, what water does, how it interacts, what pH is, why are all those properties so essential to living organisms as we exist today.